in the neck, and then the thoracic cavity, there is no peritoneum. The last little inch and a half would be retro, okay? Oh. So the most distal region is going to be retro. All right, that's why it was confusing, because it really is associated with the peritoneum, okay? All right, the next part of the digestive tract would be the stomach. And what's the stomach? And trap, because we have the lesser vent up above, which goes around the anterior and posterior to meet inferiorly to form the greater omentum. So it's definitely in trap. All right? And then I'm not sure we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but when we look at the small intestine, we have three regions. So we'll look at those separately. So the duodenum. What is the duodenum? Retro, okay, it was one of those situations where it got rotated over and pushed against the posterior abdominal wall and lost its posterior peritoneum. So the duodenum is going to be retro, all right, and the duodenum and ileum are within our mesentery proper. So if they're with, if they have a mesentery, then they're in all right. So both of these are going to be intra. All right, so we kind of go back and forth. Retro and then intra and then retro and then intra. And we continue this pattern with the large intestine, all right? So here's the ileum coming out of the mesentery proper. And I'll diagram this on the board in just a moment. Um, the appendix we mentioned briefly when we talked about the immune system. It actually has its own mesentery, okay? And then the ascending colon is retro. So I'll continue that with our pattern over here. So for the large intestine or colon, so appendix, is intra. And I'll move this up here so you can see it in the back. Ascending colon is retro. What about the transverse colon? What would that be? Does it have a mesentery? We have a transverse colon mesentery? Yeah, transverse mesocolon. All right, so since it has a mesentery, it's intra. The transverse colon is intra. Descending colon is back to retro. And then the sigmoid colon has its own mesentery as well, although that's not a structure you need to identify for lab. It's just too difficult to find it illustrated. So the sigmoid colon <coughs> is intra. What would the rectum be? In front. Think back to that um, sagittal section we drew. In front, below the peritoneum. Okay. Alrighty, so those are all the peritoneal relationships that you need to know. I'll give you a chance to get those down. So if it has a mesentery, it's intra, okay?
And don't, again, don't memorize this list, but visualize the mesenteric structures, okay? And if you can't visualize the mesenteric structure, then assume that it's either retro or infra. Now, I didn't talk about the liver or the pancreas. Those are coming up, but they're not part of the actual digestive tract, okay? And they're both retro. Um, I mean, in, the opposite, sorry. The liver is intra and the pancreas is retro, but they're not part of our back and forth for our digestive tract. Okay, may I erase that? And we'll go through the structures of the colon. We'll look at the gross anatomical structures first. So when you can see a segment of the small intestine attaching to the large intestine, that's how you're going to know it's the ileum. All right. Otherwise, it's just a coil of tubes in the middle, and it's, unless it's colored differently, it's impossible to distinguish. All right. Then we have the cecum. So the cecum is a brine pouch, which is the beginning of the ascending colon. <coughs> And off of the cecum is the appendix. Now it's shown, kind of pointing over here to the midline. However, most of the time the appendix is bent back and tucked up behind on the posterior aspect um, of the cecum. So it looks a bit like a worm. So its full name is vermiform. Vermis means worm. And again, its purpose is thought by a few people. I don't know that it's necessarily widely accepted, but some researchers in England came up with the theory that it hasn't been proven, it's just the theory, um, that the purpose of the appendix is to provide a replacement, a replenishment of the gut bacteria after um, massive diarrhea, okay? Uh, such as typhoid fever or something like that. Maybe of the proper type of gut. I mean, babies are born with a bacteria in their gut and they develop um, a normal flora. So I'm not quite sure where I stand on that particular aspect, but that's the um, proposed component. There is a bit of a fold. It's not a true circular sphincter, um, but there's a bit of a circular fold that creates our next sphincter. So, so far we've had the orbicularis or sphincter, which is voluntary muscle for the mouth. Uh, we skipped the one between the pharynx and the esophagus. And then we have the cardiac sphincter, or gastroesophageal, between the stomach and the duodenum, we have the pyloric. So this is our next one, which is identified as the ileocecal sphincter. And it would have the same sequence of control. So parasympathetic, still vagus, all right, is going to cause relaxation of that sphincter. So food now that has been digested and maximally reabsorbed will move from the small intestine into the large intestine, all right? So we have the ascending colon, which doesn't go quite as high on the right side as it does on the left because of the liver, okay? Um, these pouches are known as haustra or haustrum. That's singular. Haustra is plural. <coughs> Anybody read uh, Watership Down? I don't know when it came out, 70s. I read it in the early 80s. It's a novel about a population of rabbits and their habitats. I'm not sure of the background underlying purpose of it. However, to an aside here, it did give me my favorite, all time favorite license plate for a car. In Southern California, I almost bought a there was a VW rabbit that I saw, and the license plate was Harududu, which is the rabbit word for car in the book Watership Down. This is classic. Um, but that was the first time in my biology science kind of concept 
that the haustra and the movement of the uh, fecal matter through the haustra um, helps to determine what the scap or the bowel movements of the animal look like, all right? So in animals that move through rapidly and have large haustra, you have the soft patties like a cow or an elephant, um, other animals, small dried pellets, all right? So that has to do partially with the uh, mechanism of the haustra. And we'll get to the muscle, the longitudinal muscle change that helps to form the haustra. All right, so this is ascending colon. And then you don't need to view the terms, but the bend here is called a flexor. And because it's on the right side where the liver is, it's known as the hepatic flexor. I don't think that's a structure in your lab, but if you read about it, and then it kind of hangs down for the transverse colon. And the mesocolon would be the mesentery that suspends that from the posterior abdominal wall. So again, that's intra, and ascending colon is retro. We can put that as a reminder up here. What's the blood supply to the large intestine so far? The regions of the amounts of large intestine that I put up on the board. Superior mesenteric artery. We're just going to stop at this area here. Okay? That same location is where our parasympathetic supply by the vagus nerve stops. Okay? So vagus nerve has done parasympathetic to the stomach, the duodenum, all of the small intestine, and it does ascending and transverse colon. And then at this point, it switches over to what? What's the rare, where's the rest of our uh, parasympathetic coming from once we're past vagus? We've covered it with the uh, urinary system and the reproductive system. Not sacral, the other one. He asked for parasympathetic, yeah, pelvic splitnik, okay? The, the sympathetic would be sacral splitnik for this component, okay? So we have the splitnik flexure, and then we descend down in the descending colon, and this would be retro again. I always have to draw myself a little bit of a guidance. So we have this S-shaped <coughs> structure, which also has its own mesentery, and that's the sigmoid colon. Okay. And since it has its own mesentery, we're back to inter. And then finally, we've gone over it a few times, we have the rectum and anal canal, okay? <coughs> the rectum is infra, as is the last two inches here, which are anal canal. They're actually in the perineal area. They're below the levator in our hand. All right, so you can see that there is this band, this narrow band called the tinea coli. And it's one of three. And actually on the posterior, it leads you right to the appendix, okay? And what it is, is the longitudinal, the muscularis externa, outer longitudinal layer, has been limited to these three bands, okay? So it's the only outer, the only external longitudinal layer smooth muscle that there is, and that helps to create the pouches. And it's still smooth muscle. You don't have to worry about the epiploic appendages. Those are little appendages <coughs> of adipose tissue attached to the cerebral components. All right, so those are the, our last valve is um, twofold. 
just like the bladder, we have a smooth internal anal sphincter, which is a thickening of the um, circular muscle. which would be relaxed with parasympathetic. And then the levator ani contributes to the external anal sphincter, which is skeletal. And the nerve for that would be? Pudendal. Pudendal, excellent. So the same neural reflex, type of neural reflex for defecation that we saw for micturition. So stretching of the rectum with the presence of um, fecal matter sends sensory input back to the spinal cord via the pudendal nerve. Um, and that causes the parasympathetic to relax the internal anal sphincter and start par uh, peristaltic contraction of the rectum, All right? Which of course, we have to inhibit the pudendal motor innervation to allow the external anal sphincter to relax. Okay, and blood supply for the descending colon. The sigmoid colon is going to be our inferior mesenteric artery. And of course, for the rectum, we have superior and middle and inferior rectal components. All right, let's take a look at the g pass So if you're ready, I'll erase what's on the board and we'll look at our mucosa and some mucosa. Comparison, starting with the esophagus and moving through the colon and rectum, kind of side by side. And these all three models. This is the small intestine with intestinal glands and the villi that we talked about on uh, Wednesday. And then when we move to the uh, colon or rectum, it looks similar to the stomach. Uh, we don't have gastric pits because we don't have the wider area. We just have glands, all right? So just basic, simple intestinal glands. Can I raise the board down? Let's have that. Intestinal glands. 
All right, this is what you're seeing up here. So for the mucosa, still a simple columnar epithelium. Michael And the only significant difference that helps you recognize it histology wise is 25% of these cells are goblet cells. So we first see the goblet cells in the small intestine. All right, the stomach cells are just mucus cells, they're not really goblet cells in the arrangement. Um, these are goblet cells. And although it's only 25%, it looks almost like it's 90, if not 100, okay? But that very smooth surface and lots and lots of white goblet cells is very characteristic of the rectum and, and the colon, all right? Um, just a regular, loosely regular connective tissue. Nothing unique about that. and a muscularis mucosa, at least until we get to the anal canal. Okay. Um, so mucosa, standard, meaning dense, irregular, connective tissue, nothing unique. And the major change is the uh, muscularis externa. So a definite inner circular layer of smooth muscle. And the outer longitudinal is restricted to these three bands of the cumia coli. of the large intestine is the reabsorption of water. Along with that reabsorption of water are ions. What would those ions be based on our previous unit? What happens to your pH if you have diarrhea? Metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis? Acidosis. Because you've reabsorbed the hydrogen ions from the hydrochloric acid, but with diarrhea, you lose the bicarbonate ions we get from the pancreas, and therefore you have too many hydrogen ions from the hydrochloric acid of the stomach, and you're in metabolic acidosis, all right? So we need to reabsorb those bicarbonate ions, and we do so at the large intestine. There are some reabsorption of vitamins, all right, lipid vitamins, and vitamin K, which is produced by the uh, flora here. So there's a uh, limited view. Cryptolabricon is just a fancy name for intestinal gland. It's an older term. And here, looking at a posterior view, you can see how the posterior tinea coli leads right to the appendix. Okay, and then finishing off with the uh, anal canal. We've talked about this before when we talked about hemorrhoids. And we said that internal hemorrhoids, which you see here, are due to varicosities of the middle rectal uh, vein. And external hemorrhoids are due to varicosities, which means the dilated valves are not beating up uh, from the inferior rectal vein. This angle that you see right here is the levator ani muscle. 
forms a bowl, the floor of the pelvis. And then this thickening here, there's a couple of portions of it, um, the puborectalis and pubococcygeus that contribute to that. Um, hold on one moment. As this just came to mind. I think I've mentioned it to you before though. shocked when I sent them a copy of a Facebook ad. You can actually, they were selling cases for kids collecting poop. It comes in different colors with glitter on it, just like you might put a little doll or a car. There's this plastic case in the poop to collect. You know the emoji of poop that's like, looks like that? So it was just different colors of poop. And I was like, really? Why? Exactly. So this is the puborectalis muscle here, which itself is a little bit higher than the external anal sphincter, which is a thickening of the lower part of the um, anal. Just like you needed that image in your head, right? Um, so let me tell you about a patient of mine. When I was in graduate school um, at Davis, I worked every other weekend at the hospital there, and I guess a friend of mine, my husband's first wife, um, was a home health nurse. And she called me and she said, I have a patient that would be perfect for you. She said, you live in Davis, and you can pick up some extra money on the side. And so I went to visit him, and um, he had been a, a veterinarian. He was in his early 80s. And he worked in town. He was from Southern California area. And um, when he was five years old, he grew up on the field, in the farm area of Bakersfield, and he loved lima beans. Why anybody likes lima beans, I have no idea. But he loved lima beans. And he would go out in the field and eat lima beans right off of the plants, bush or whatever they grow on, low ground bush. And these had been sprayed with a pesticide. Now, how it got past his esophagus and stomach, and maybe those just healed up. But essentially, he had a chemical birth that removed the mucosa of his large intestine. So not only did he have no longer have those goblet cells, but he had a lot of scar tissue. So from the time of five, age of five, he could not have any bowel movements on his own. Instead, he had high colonic enemas. So he had he went to vet school, he got married, he went and served overseas in World War II in the Southeast Asia, and he sent you a high colonic enema. So the first time I went to, to take care of him, his wife was pottering around the back, and I asked him later, why don't you just have your wife do that? He goes, no, she's my wife. She's not, I didn't, she didn't marry me to take care of me, so he always had nurses um, that would come in. And he had, in, a, in Southern California, he had a special mm -hmm. bathroom built onto his house for this purpose. And we were just in the front room of his house in Davis. Um, and so he had a like an old fashioned ivy pole with a glass blender, um, like a two quart blender container. And instead of the metal blade at the bottom was an expanded latex tubing. The tubing itself was about the size of my thumb. And so I would mix up a pitcher full of warm, lukewarm water. Um, and the first time was just lukewarm water. And then we did another series with ivory soap. I would just kind of wash my hands with ivory soap, which is gentle. And then I'd finish up with what was supposed to be normal saline. I'd add some table salt to the water. So series-wise, so I would um, lubricate the tubing, pass it up his rectum until it got to here. And then he would take anywhere from eight to 10 quarts of fluid. 
and he would be lying on his side and I would see his toes start to curl. And so I'd encourage him to take a little bit more and then say, okay, that's enough, but I'd clamp it off, pull it out. There's a bathroom right off of the bedroom and he'd go in there for about 15 to, to 20 minutes and I'd read my research papers and he'd read his work papers because he was still working full time at 82. And he'd come back out and we'd do it again. Not eight to 12, 10 quarts of fur. I mean, he'd take about two quarts at a time, but we'd do it over and over and over up to eight to 12 quarts. And then we switch to the ivory soap and then we switch to the uh, saline. And it would take me, let's see, the first time I got there about 6.30 and probably finished around 10 or 10.30. And uh, of course he doesn't have any underpants on because I'm putting this up in his rectum. And so he pulled on his underpants the last time, he came out, sat on the bed and started to write me a check. And I just started laughing. And he said, why are you laughing? I said, do you know what this looks like? <laughs> so he was very careful to always put Arian after my name. And um, I probably did this for about a year and a half until I finished graduate school and moved back to Tennessee. Um, but I often, you know, I wondered why he didn't just have a colostomy. His, he had two, do two daughters and they knew nothing about this. Because one son was coming down from the Sonora area, was going to spend the summer. And he was really worried how we were going to fit this schedule in without his kids finding out. And um, he said, no, he was very grateful that he could do this and not have to have a colostomy. So all through elementary school, high school, university, vet school, serving overseas, he took care of the cavalry uh, for the army overseas. Um, he had this procedure done. And he was not alone because he said his aunt, so he was five when this happened. And he said his aunt, um, who was in her early 20s, and this is back in the early 1900s, because in, you know, he was like 1905 when this happened to him. Um, when she was uh, younger, she had, was dating a guy, this guy, a dentist, nothing against dentists, but he was dating a brother-in-law who was a dentist. Um, and they were going to go to a dance at the local fire station. And he was late. So her friend said, he knows where the dance is. She's 45 minutes late, come with us. And so she did. And he showed up at the fire station. And while they were dancing, he shot her in the lower back with a small pistol. And she was paralyzed um, for the rest of her life. And her digestive tract did not work because it affected her parasympathetic component of the sacral spinal cord. And so she already, he already had a family member that had to undergo this colonic enema treatment. Um, but it, was a, it has always served as a very good illustration of what the lack of that mucosal <coughs> epithelium for that lubrication provides. So again, there was also scar tissue, but between the two, um, he, like I said, he was very happy he didn't have to have a colostomy. <laughs> Colostomies are sometimes temporary. All right, they can be done to give the colon some rest if someone has ulcerative colitis, and then the segments are reattached or it can be permanent if there's cancer and part of the colon is removed. So it's brought to the surface of this uh, skin and a stoma is created. I don't know if I have an image of that or not. No. Um, and the contents can be quite caustic to the skin. Of course, if it's close, if it's proximal to the ileum, it's gonna be more liquid because you haven't reabsorbed. It's constantly draining. You know how amount of room or air freshener is going to take away that smell. If it's over on this side, they can sometimes train their bodies to have a regular bowel movement, like first thing in the morning, and they'll still wear a bag, a colostomy bag, just for protection in case of an accident or something like that. But of course, the farther away it is from the small intestine, the more opportunity there is for the fluid to be reabsorbed. Okay. Okay, we have another question. So, which of these structures are retroperitoneal <laughs> of any type, primary or secondary? And mark all that applies. Thank you.
ascending is retro and then transverse is intro. So definitely D. where we can see this transition between non quantified stratified squamous and simple columnar. The anal sphincter, I mean the anal canal and the rectum. And the other location is higher up, the esophagus and the stomach. All right, so we're going to see the gastric pits. We're not going to, we might see mucus cells, they're not goblin, but it's hard to tell at this level, but they're only going to be like the first third, first 25% to third of the depth of the gland. Um, rather than the entire plant. Okay. All right. So that's the digestive tract proper, though, through which the food's going to move. <coughs> so we're going to move to the accessory organs of the liver and the pancreas. Okay. Now we've looked at the liver a little bit already because we talked about the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus and the structures they contain, but we really haven't looked at the lobes. So let's take a look at those structures. May I raise the board? around the um, inferior vena cava, this below before it actually um, passes through the diaphragm. The smaller model is more realistic, just because this one is tilted up on a stand that's not anatomically <laughs> in position, all right? So here you can see that the stomach is not in place. Um, this is a little small for a human liver, this is huge. So somewhere in between. You should not be able to feel more than about an inch of your liver before, below your lower ribs, if you can feel it at all, okay? Um, the liver tends to enlarge with disease, where the epithelial tissue is destroyed and scar tissue takes its place. Because the liver grows as an outpouching of the embryonic gut, as does the pancreas. So it's a gland, and if you recall from Bio 430, our glands, except for the post 